Hello, everybody. Welcome to our spring lecture series for 2023. Uh, I'm Carrie Soden, as I assume most of you know, I am the archaeological and research director here for the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Um, thank you all for signing up, showing up, logging on on Zoom. And for those of you, a uh, special welcome to those of you that are at the watch party uh, in Toledo with Ellen and Dominic. Thanks for coming out. Uh, as always, please don't forget, you can always donate to our organization at nmgl.org backslash donate. We, uh, we do programs like these um, for our members as well as for the public and any donations always help to offset costs like uh, the Zoom platform or something along those lines. Uh, tonight is the first of our spring lecture series for 2023. Don't forget, if you need closed captions, just turn them on with the control bar at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues at all with the Zoom portion, please log out and then log back in. That seems to fix most of the problems that users have. If anything were to happen to your feed tonight, as always, we are taping this evening and we'll have it up on our YouTube channel by Monday at the latest. And I will be sending out a link to all the registered participants. As usual, we will have a Q&A at the end of the talk. Please post for those of you on Zoom, go ahead and post your questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, for those of you at the watch party, let Ellen know. So tonight we delve into something we don't do enough of in our lecture series, a topic of Canadian origins. Admiral Surveyor Henry Wolseley Bayfield spent 40 years of his life mapping Canadians' vast coasts and in inland waterways. A heroic Napoleonic era naval officer, explorer, naturalist, and polymath, Bayfield was one of the most extraordinary individuals of the 19th century. His navigational charts saved countless lives and vessels and literally mapped the way for settlement into the interior of the continent. Telling us about this intrepid visitor tonight is David Yates, an award-winning author and semi-retired teacher with the Avon Maitland District School Board. Uh, he taught history in Huron County and that's Huron County, Ontario, I might add, high schools, and served 17 years on the Goddard's Town Council. Since 2007, his local history column has appeared regularly in the Huron County papers, and he's written several books on Huron County history. Um, he does have a, a book on Admiral Bayfield, which was uh, uh, published by the Bayfield Historical Society, which unfortunately we were not able to get, but if you're interested, you can find it at bayfieldhistorical.ca. And I will remind you of that again at the end of this. So with that, I will turn everything over to David and uh, we enjoy. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for that kind introduction. Now I'm gonna be drinking water, but some of you might wanna get a mug of grog or your favorite ale and sit back. And in the next few minutes, we're gonna be learning about one of the most extraordinary uh, individuals in uh, 19th century history. At least we in Canada like to think that. And I'm just trying to set up. We had this old. Uh, let's see if we can get this right here. Now, can everyone see that? I'm going to speak for everyone and say yes. Okay, so we can all see that. Excellent. Okay, so our subject tonight is Admiral Henry Wolsey Bayfield, Royal uh, Navy. He was the master chart maker of the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence. And I would argue that he is on a par with the great map maker, uh, David Thompson. David Thompson mapped the uh, Western interior of North America or British North America at the time. And um, he gets a lot of credit, but unfortunately for Henry Wolsey Bayfield doesn't get nearly the recognition that uh, David Thompson did. Henry Wolsey was born at Kingston upon Hull on January 25th, 1795. His father was John Wolsey Bayfield and his mother was Eliza Pettit. Now, the family were lower gentry. They were marginal gentry and they were what, uh, what they were day class and they were struggling to keep maintain their gentry lifestyle. Bayfield was baptized at St. Edmund's Anglican Church or the Episcopal Church in, in the U.S. in Norfolk County. The cradle, Norfolk County, by the way, is the cradle of sailors. That's where uh, uh, Lord Nelson was born. 
Little is known about his early schooling, other than he must have been a little bit literate to join. He must have known his letters and numbers to be able to join the Royal Navy as a gentleman volunteer or supernumerary volunteer. His father had a commission in the uh, British Army, but the family was too poor to afford a commission for their son, young Henry, to join uh, a fashionable British regiment. At that time in the British Army, uh, gentlemen officers had to purchase their commissions. They didn't have to go through a military training school like Sam, like in Canada or, or, or West Point. Uh, entered him in the Royal Navy as what they called a supernumerary or gentleman volunteer. And his first ship was aboard the HMS Pompeii um, 74 guns. Just six hours out of port, out of Portsmouth, he saw his first action just uh, before his 11th birthday. The Royal Navy that um, he joined in 1805, uh, 1806, the Royal Navy that, uh, um, Bayfield had joined was uh, it, Lord Nelson had been killed at the Battle of Trafalgar on October 21st, 1805. He had joined just months later. It's believed that Nelson's father and Bayfield's father belonged to the same Masonic Lodge, and that might have been the connection that got Bayfield entered into the Royal Navy. Now, this is the Napoleonic Navy, and despite uh, Sir Winston Churchill's admonition that it was governed by rum, saw to be in the lash. The Royal Navy in uh, Nelson's era was an elite service. They saw themselves as an elite service. Um, I know the Hollywood image from Mutiny on the Bounty is that they were virtual. The Royal Navy was a virtual floating concentration camp, but the truth is much the truth is much more complex. The movie Master and Commander, the Patrick O'Brien series of novels, is, is much closer, I think, to reality than say Mutiny on the Bounty. And uh, when he joined at the age of eleven. Discipline was harsh, discipline was physical, but a lot of boys seem and later uh, recall later in life that there was the use of the lash, but most recall the fun and excitement of life at sea and as being part of something bigger than themselves. One of the things that would have uh, formed Bayfield's more formal education was life on board the ship. Skill and education were an important part of a boy seaman's training. They had to not just learn literally the ropes, how to, learning how to sail a king's warship, but Bayfield, as a gentleman volunteer, was educated in languages. We know he could sp speak uh, French. We know he uh, learned Latin and Greek. He would have been taught ge geography, geometry, trigonometry, astronomy, all the important practical subjects for life at sea and navigation. And among the other subjects he was expected to master were hydrography or water surveying, map making, and drawing. And drawing became an incredibly important part of a young gentleman officer's um, training because they didn't have GPS, they didn't have cameras or anything. Officers were expected to sketch coastlines and make accurate drawings of fortifications, waterways, landmarks, that sort of thing. And he was very good at that. And by all accounts, Bayfield took to the sea like a duck to water. And he um, fought in a series of naval actions between 1806 to 1814. Remember, in 1806, he's only 11 years old. And in September 1806, um, he distinguished himself at Gibraltar when his brig, uh, the Duchess of Bedford at 14 guns, bested two larger and more heavily armed gunboats. And his commander, uh, the quote above comes from his commander, uh, said that Bayfield had the presence of mind that would become the greatest sea warrior. And so he was promoted to first class volunteer. Remember, he commanded a gunship of 14 guns when he's 11. And while he was on patrol in the English Channel aboard the HMS Beagle, a ship of 18 guns, it was also called the Golden Beagle because it um, captured a lot of uh, French warships, commercial ships that they would tow in the port and sell for prize money. This is where the Bayfield family hoped to restore their family fortunes because uh, when you captured a warship or you captured a French vessel, you tow it into port and the cargo and the ship itself would be sold. The officers and ratings, uh, enlisted men or ratings, they would be uh, assigned prize money based on their rank and what they actually did in the action to help capture the vessel. Bayfield apparently was able to send back quite, we don't know how much, but he was able to uh, greatly help, especially because by this time his mother and father were living separately, but he was able to greatly help his mother's finances anyway. 
In uh, April 1809, he fought his most distinguished action, and that was at the Battle of the Basque Roads in the uh, Gulf of Biscay. Uh, Bayfield's ship and his fleet was under the command of the legendary swashbuckler, Lord Thomas Cochrane, and Bayfield on the Beagle, uh, his job, he volunteered. He volunteered at 14 years old to take the Beagle, his ship that he was in command of. He volunteered to take the Beagle in to be the first of the British warships to enter the um, enter the port where the French fleet was riding at anchor. The idea was for the battle that day was that the English, uh, the Royal Navy sent in fire ships, so a series of fire ships to help break up the French fleet. And when the French fleet was breaking up, it was hoped that uh, the smaller gunships would come in and take on the larger ships. And uh, that's exactly what happened. The Beagle was in the thick of the fighting and Bayfield caused several French ships to strike their colors, including one, uh, the French ship, the Eagle, and it was, I think, about 78 guns. And uh, he was able to do it because he had, uh, he was able to sail his ship and rake with the 18 guns of the Beagle back and forth. He was able to rake the ship with incredibly accurate gunfire from stern to uh, bow or stern to stem. And it wreaked terrible, terrible damage on the Eagle. It caused the Eagle to ground itself and it struck its colors. And he later wrote his mother, Bayfield wrote his mother, that it was a glorious day. And for his bravery, Bayfield was promoted to master's mate. One of the things he failed or neglected to mention to his mother that he was one of the few British seamen that was wounded that day. But he had a good Napoleonic, he, he had a good, he had a good war, as they used to say, and uh, he did very well in the Napoleonic Wars, and that's where he thought he'd ended. After Napoleon was exiled in 1814, Bayfield no volunteered for the North American Sea Service, and he patrolled the U.S. seaboard. Uh, he was posted to Lake Champlain, but it was uh, Lake Champlain had ended, so he didn't see any action on station in North America. And uh, as I said, the war ended before he saw any action on the inland lakes. He was promoted to lieutenant in March 1815, and he was taken under the wing of Captain William Fitzwilliam Owen, who was uh, the commander of the Royal Naval uh, Stations on the Great Lakes. Owen was impressed with uh, Bayfield's meticulous attention to detail. And he kept Bayfield on the upper lakes while most of the other uh, Royal Navy officers, both uh, in North America and in Europe, were being pensioned off on half pay. Lieutenant Bayfield was assigned by Captain William Fitz William Owen to uh, assist him in the hydrographic work around Kingston to survey the Thousand Islands and the, um, the uh, eastern part of uh, Lake Ontario. Now, uh, Captain Owen was censured, or sort of, he was kind of, he, he was kind of questioned about his choice of Bayfield because he had all these other senior officers, far more senior and far more experienced than Bayfield. But Captain Owen was not somebody to be pushed around. He was kind of a difficult personality. He was uh, a, a very stern taskmaster, a strict disciplinarian. In fact, in 1797, he was one of the causes of the Great Mutiny in the North, and, and uh, uh, but he did go on. He was a competent seaman, competent navigator, and competent warrior. Later in life, he became a militant abolitionist, anti-slaver, and he, like a lot of in the Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy, he uh, assisted in intercepting slave ships bound from Africa for North America, the Caribbean, and South America. He became a justice. He retired to Canada, became a justice of the peace and vice admiral. But Owen taught Bayfield, and, and he wasn't when, when they questioned him about his choice of Bayfield, and they suggested all these other officers. You can imagine a man like Captain Owen wasn't going to be pushed around, and he insisted that he keep uh, Lieutenant Bayfield. And Owen taught Bayfield the surveyor's trade and was impressed with, as I said, his really accurate, meticulous note keeping and uh, capacity for hard work. So he was kept in Owen's service, and he was ordered to board the HMS Star, which was based out of Kingston in March 1816. And he made a running survey of the north shores of Lake Erie in Ontario, and he did an excellent job of that. But when he was assigned, strangely enough, when Bayfield was assigned the, uh, the hydrographic service uh, on the Great Lakes, 
he wrote his mother that he thought it would be the burial, quote, the burial of his career. He was very unenthusiastic at first, but in fact, his greatest service to the Navy in Canada uh, was about to begin. Um, at the, in the immediate aftermath of the War of 1812, British uh, strategic planners are faced with the dilemma of defending Canada. Okay, And the Duke of Wellington, the great Duke, was very interested in Canadian affairs and how to defend uh, the, a remote part of the empire. And he put, he, he, he put his finger on the problem in one sentence. He put his finger on the problem of defending Canada uh, from the Americans. He said, it was all frontier and nothing else. And one of the things that both the British War Office and the Admiralty realized that they had to have a Great Lake survey was deemed not necessary by the Admiralty and the colonial authorities to chart the waterways and coastline for defensive reasons. He didn't really, it wasn't at first, it wasn't to map a way for settlement into the interior of the continent because the British were content to have the indigenous peoples uh, be masters of the, of the continent's interior. It was mostly a military survey to identify plate, na, well, how to navigate into the Great Lakes. And he was supposed on the British or Canadian side, identify places for fleets and, and fortifications. The second part was to help establish the US-British border after the War of 1812. And uh, he seemed to take his, he, he took his job very, very seriously. And in fact, at one point, uh, he did understand the great favor or service that um, Captain William had done for him. And he told, he wrote the Admiralty that he, uh, that he had without hesitation accepted the uh, pr employment proposed. He, in 1817, when Owen was recalled, Bayfield was appointed, had the grand title of Admiralty Survey of the Great Lakes, and it was a Herculean task. And he was assigned only one Royal Navy midshipman, Philip Collins, who was 15, to assist him. And uh, they were allowed to hire six to eight oarsmen or navigators to help them. He mostly hired <coughs> basically whoever they can, but a lot of them tended to be Courier de Bois and uh, Métis and just anybody who he could get to endure the conditions that, uh, the, uh, of the service. And as I said, he at first was based out of the Kingston Hydrographic Office, by the way, this map down here, this sketch map, is Bayfield's map of Kingston Harbor um, in 1819. Bayfield did the original is a pen and ink sketch that he did, and it had been later covered, uh, colored by Sir Edmund Wiley Greer, uh, and it's a famous painting of Kingston or an early painting of Kingston Harbor. But Captain Owen said, in recommending him, his service will says will ever be valuable, uh, and Bayfield accepted without hesitation, as I said. Now, uh, with Admiralty reductions placed on the Great Lakes, Bayfield's party, as I said, only had one midshipman and a few boatmen to help survey the lakes. It was a monster, it was like a, 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 a Herculean task to be able to survey the Great Lakes, except Lake Michigan, because that was completely in American waters. And he only was allowed, he had two boats, small open top boats built, and he named them the Ramsden and Troughton, named after famous English navigational instrument makers. And they were nothing more than small open top vessels crammed with their equipment. They were very uncomfortable. They got sick quite a bit. Bayfield was laid low. I mean, you can almost, they, they suffered from og and cold and all the chills and all the usual kind of ailments that you would expect in frontier service. And, but, you know, they were pretty effective. By the fall of 1817, Bayfield's party had surveyed all of Lake Erie to the Detroit River, Lake St. Clair to the St. Clair River. And then in the fall of 1817, uh, he then began to survey the American side of Lake Huron that fall. Now that might seem strange, but the Americans were aware that he was going to be surveying their shore and he was given instructions to cooperate uh, with American authorities whenever he could. But if he had any trouble, he was to re uh, uh, immediately he was immediately to withdraw and report whatever trouble he made or obstruction he had to the um, Admiralty in uh, Quebec City. He never, as far as I'm aware in his correspondence, he never encountered any sort of obstruction from US authorities. And he had the most primitive of instruments at the time. Remember, he doesn't have GPS. He had the most primitive of instruments to go in and chart uncharted waters. And like the transit we see there and 
a chronometer, a sextant. And how they did it, their primary instruments were, as I said, the transit, prism, sextants, chronometer, and a chain, a chain is six feet long, and there's 100 lengths in the chain, and each length is eight inches, and two, there's two hands. You probably remember that from school. But anyway, how they did it, they did a running survey. One officer was stationary along the shore with a the theodolite or transit. The other one was placing six foot stakes uh, that would be visible from two miles away along points along the shore for measurement. The guy with the theodolite or transit would take shots and measure where the stakes were. And uh, they would take them back and they would plot them on graphs, little dots on graphs, but they check and second check their their uh, position, their navigational position by using, you know, uh, the stars and the sex and, and, and they did it and they double checked each other's work and it was incredibly precise and incredibly accurate. There you see in the middle, actually we got this chart, the Bayfield Historical Society found this chart and it was at, at one point it was stamped U.S. Navy somewhere on it. Uh, they found this in the U.S. Naval Archive, or a U.S. Archive and clearly the Americans used his charts. And that's the thing about the Hydrographic Service. It was founded in seven, the Royal Navy Hydrographic Service was founded in 1795. And they were to attract only officers of brains and ability. And one of their instructions was to draft maps that would be aesthetically pleasing so that any captain would be pleased to display them on their chart table. They really are works of art. And we'll talk more about that later. They also used a primitive sounding device in their boats that they could sound uh, and measure depths. And it worked not too badly. It was fairly accurate. It was outdated by the time of steam vessels, which needed far more precise and accurate depth soundings than it was with sailing vessels, but they did pretty, pretty well. And belly fielded columns worked, I said, pretty efficiently and well together on this remote uh, part of the empire. And just for comparison, the map on the left, this is about the only map or the latest map that had been done of Lake Huron. Uh, it was not for navigation. Obviously, it wasn't for navigational purposes, but you could see how distorted the map is and how inaccurate compared to the Bayfield charts. These were done in 1782. That's known as the red line map because uh, this is uh, from a, a book from a friend of mine, Gord Garland. The red line map, uh, it's so named because there's a, this is a red line demarking the British and and American boundary on the Great Lakes, so it's called the Red Line. It was done after, in 1782 after the Treaty of Paris when they were trying to determine, after the American uh, War of Independence, they were trying to determine what the boundary lines were, and they come back to that. But compare that to the maps or charts on the right. Now, I understand that this isn't, the one on the left isn't a navigational map, but you can see how much more precise and accurate Bayfields, that, that chart there is, the Southern Lake here in chart. The other one is of Georgian Bay. Well, you can compare that to this and you can see what a fast improvement that uh, Bayfield's charts were. And they were good for pinpoint accuracy and the Admiralty approved of his work. And of course the Georgian Bay survey took four years to complete. He reported in a 10 week stretch that his party had asked to quote, ascertain the shape, size, and situation of upwards of 6,000 islands, flats, and rocks. In total, over 20,000 islands were plotted on the Lake Huron survey alone. And if any of you are sailors and have sailed up around the Georgian Bay and North Channel and the Sioux, you understand what an immense task that was set before Bayfield. And they attacked it with alacrity and they did it fairly well. And, and he said it was the most difficult part of the survey. Uh, in the lower left here, that's Peter Rindlisbacher's painting of Penetanguishing. The Royal Navy had a naval station at Penetang, a small naval station at Penetanguishing on Lake Huron. And in 1819, that's a rendition, uh, Peter Rindlisbacher's uh, rendition of the naval station that was there. And that naval station uh, was largely responsible. They had three small gunboats, the HMS Wasp, Hornet, and B and the HMSB provided provisions. They'd link up with Bayfield's expedition on the Great Lakes or on Georgian Bay and Lake here, and they'd link up with them and provision the expedition. In 18, uh, and there is the Georgian Bay uh, party survey. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Bayfield's tiny party, he later said, 
He destroyed his, for reasons we don't know, in 1847, he destroyed his Great Lakes survey journals. He kept his the survey notes, but he destroyed the journals, which is a curiosity that I have no explanation for. We know most of what he did on the Great Lakes through his correspondence with the Admiralty. He made regular reports to the Admiralty. And in one report, he talked about the extremities of cold and tempestuous waters, and they were tormented by clouds of mosquitoes that darkened the air, and they worried about fever, chills. He thought he got scurvy. They didn't get scurvy, but they were constant companions. Bayfield's expedition, they had to carry enough supplies for at least 25 days, and they could also rely on the local natives. Had Bayfield's expedition uh, uh, not been welcomed by the natives, they couldn't have, they couldn't have did what they did. The natives at that time were fairly strong allies of the crown, the, the, the British, and uh, Bayfield apparently enjoyed excellent relations with the indigenous peoples. He was, the family said he spoke several languages. He might have had a smattering of a couple of the indigenous languages, and but but I, I, I doubt he was smart, but I don't know if he was smart enough to pick up uh, uh, fluently anyway, some of the indigenous di uh, dialects and languages. Big Chief and Collins is Little Chief. That was the name that was given to them. But, but almost a century later, there was a lot of pride in the, in the Ojibwa people because you see that they were part of Bayfield's ex, uh, expedition. And there is a tremendous pride in being associated with that expedition because they took pains to have it recorded family histories and books, the history of the area. And um, as I said, his expedition had the support of the particularly the Ojibwa, what we used to call the Chippewa people, they supplied his party or supplemented their diet with food and added intelligence reports on what was happening either with the fur traders or what the Americans were up to and all that stuff. And at that time, I said, I can't stress enough that the indigenous people saw the crown as an ally against the US and supported Bayfield's survey expedition. Had they not have supported it or had they been hostile, he, he was, well, he was ordered to leave if anything like that happened but they wouldn't have been here that long. And then he went on to Lake Superior uh, in 1823. He began the Lake Superior survey. And once again, he was afforded all courtesy by the Hudson Bay Company. The Hudson Bay Company was a quasi official arm of the British government. They handled diplomacy in the interior, crown indigenous, and maybe even uh, American diplomacy in the interior of the continent until the Crown was strong enough to establish a presence out West. They were given the loan of the Hudson Bay Company vessel on recovery on Lake Superior, but they kind of preferred their two open top vessels because they were faster and more efficient for coastal surveys. The recovery was more of a supply vessel. Uh, and while on the Lake Superior survey, Bayfield collected rock and uh, flora and fauna samples that were sent to the British Museum in London. And uh, he wrote the first command, uh, he wrote the first uh, geologic history of Lake Superior and called the Outlines of Geology of Lake Superior. And it was a pioneering work on Northern Ontario's geologic composition. And it's amazing how he knew the Latin words and could, he, he, in, in all the years that he was sailing, they had lots of spare time on his hand. He made use of the ship's libraries that were always kept on board ships. And he taught himself I said he taught himself things like Latin and Greek. He 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 spoke French very fluently, and probably Spanish because he was on the Spanish on station in Gibraltar. But like I said, he 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 was quite an intellect as well as an explorer, and he was the first European to circumnavigate Lake Superior that we know of. And while he was on Lake Superior, he met what I would consider his counterpart on land. We're all famous. We're all uh, taught about David Thompson, at least in, we used to be taught about David Thompson as the great map maker in Canadian public school. And he met, he, he, we know he met him on Lake Superior. I think he might have met him because they would have been on Lake Huron at the same time while they were doing, after the War of 1812, they were doing an expedition that set the US Canadian boundary yet again on the Great Lakes. And we know he, they met because Bayfield mentions that he met and encountered David Thompson on Lake Superior and Bayfield's expedition was to afford him all assistance that they could in chart making and map making. But I suspect they met earlier on Lake Huron. I, I, I can't prove it, but they were on Lake Huron at the same time. It would have been really unusual had Lake Huron in the year, in, in, uh, had the two of them not have encountered each other or wanted to count because they would have had important information 
that would have been valuable to each other's mission. Uh, but as I said, Bayfield's mission on the Lake Superior was a sensitive one. He was instructed to withdraw and report any in incident with U.S. authorities immediately. There was, as far as I can determine through his correspondence, there was none whatsoever. And in fact, whenever they did encounter uh, American authorities, uh, relations were pretty convivial. During the winter months, of course, they'd go to Bayfield and Collins, winter to pen a tanguish machine, and they'd spend countless hours bent over charts plotting their calculations that they'd made during the season. And it was tedious work. In fact, Bayfield even developed a stomach ailment that he credited to being hunched over in a cold drafty cabin at Penetanguishene for so many hours, plotting their points on chart paper and that sort of thing. And then they'd send the charts to Quebec and Quebec would send them to London, to the hydrographical uh, office in London where they'd be printed and lithographed. But the charts were made in Penetanguishene beautifully made charts. And they, they spent, as I said, they go to Quebec, they'd be routed through Quebec and then to the hydrographic office in London. The other important person that he kind of met while he was at Lake, uh, on Lake Superior was in May, 1825, as Bayfield's Lake Superior mission, Lake Great Lakes mission is wrapping up. He encountered at the Fort William or Thunder Bay now, Captain John Franklin. And he was on his second expedition, first overland expedition, considered his most uh, successful because he went overland up to the Arctic or up to the to see if the Northwest Passage was indeed a passage. He determined that it was, and it was a, uh, it indeed was a, a waterway, maybe not navigable yet, but that was probably his most successful expedition because only about half of his crew died. Of course, several years later, he was involved in the, um, he led a doomed expedition to find the Northwest Passage, and he and 144 members of his, the crew of his two ships, the HMS Terror and Erebus, perished under mysterious, uh, under still what we don't know what killed them all, but uh, other than the, other than the elements, but uh, he met Sir John, Fr or Captain John Franklin, and in fact, John Franklin, because Bayfield traded chronometers, Franklin's chronometer a whack or broken, the crystal was shattered, and Bayfield, because he was about to wrap up, Bayfield loaned him his chronometer, which was still in pretty good working order, and then they sent the other one back for repairs. But Bayfield's maps on the Great Lakes, charts of the Great Lakes, were used by both uh, American authorities, uh, commercial and government navigation, as well as British and Canadian navigation, until Captain George Gordon Mead survey charts, the lakes here in Michigan, were produced when he was put in charge of the survey of the Great Lakes in, I think, 1857, and he held that position until the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. Of course, you would all know that he became a major general in the U.S. Army and commanded the Union forces at the Battle of Gettysburg. But it's important to remember that an important personage took up the, uh, took up the survey um, surveyors trade on the Great Lakes. Now, Bayfield returns to Great Britain, and uh, he was thought he'd be put on half pay. I mean, there's no wars for the Royal Navy to fight. The naval establishment is placed on, uh, well, on, is being reduced still 10 years after the Napoleonic Wars. Is, but and he, as I said, he expected to be placed on half pay, and that means relegated to near poverty, genteel poverty, but he suggested that an immediate survey of the St. Lawrence River and Gulf of St. Lawrence be undertaken. <clears throat> the last one that had been done was in the 1780s by uh, Captain DeBar, who was a prodigy of Captain Cook. Bayfield, when he's asking to do this or recommending this survey, he's, of course, because of course, Nick Cook was one of the most revered figures in the Royal Navy, but he did point out, but he did point out that the bar's charts were incredibly inaccurate. Anacostia Island, which is a big island in uh, the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, he had one full degree of latitude out. And the Admiralty must have been thinking the same thing because they promoted him immediately to commander and he gave him the task of serving the St. Lawrence River and Gulf of St. Lawrence in 1827. Now, locally, we in Huron County on the west shore or east shore of Lake Huron, uh, it's important because Bayfield was asked to advise the Canada Company, which opened up settlement in this area of Ontario 
to determine areas along the lake shore of Lake Huron. And he did, he pointed out the place I live in, Goderidge, and he established those as uh, ideal spots for settlement. And in fact, the settlement just to the south of me is called Bayfield today. And um, that's who sponsored the, the book project. Okay, so he begins the St. Lawrence River survey in 1827. He takes along with him, Collins is now a full lieutenant. And uh, amazingly, in one of the world's busiest waterways, the St. Lawrence Seaway, the St. Lawrence River, there's 200 miles of uncharted waters. And, uh, excuse me, he was able to build a two-masted survey ship, 146-ton Gulnair, uh, to his specifications in May 1828, and it was the first of three named as a survey ship. Uh, in the off-season, when they weren't surveying the St. Lawrence and the Guelph, they uh, hired it out to a private, private shipping company who paid for the costs of an upkeep of the vessel. So that way they weren't, the expenditures were kept down. He was given an authorized strength. You read there, quartermaster, boatswain's mate, seven Royal Navy seamen, uh, Canadian boatman, a steward cook and a, and, and a boy. Canadian boatmen, they would have been French Canadians. When they used the term Canadian then, they, they were usually referring to French Canadian. Um, okay, and he began surveying the St. Lawrence and his charts became, once again, he was well known for his accuracy. And in fact, his charts became eagerly awaited by the St. Lawrence pilots who had to navigate settlement ships, or ships bringing in immigrants from Ireland and the United King other parts of the United Kingdom. And as I said, the hydrographic office in the Royal Navy said they just couldn't be accurate. They had to be aesthetically pleasing, was the quotes that they used. And uh, they were. And in fact, when Lord Durham, who was the governor, who was appointed governor general after the rebellions in 1837, 38, Lord Durham was the governor general in Quebec when he was, he was, he asked for a complete set of Bayfield's charts on his arrival in Quebec City. They truly were works of art. Um, one of the things that Quebec, uh, the, the Quebec Assembly asked him to do, it's kind of a sad thing, uh, about one in three migrants that came in from the British Isles were suffering from some form of disease or illness, like cholera or whatever. And he was tasked with finding a place, an island to, uh, or some place that they could quarantine them before they were allowed into the city. And the place he chose is Gros Isle, which is about 30 miles downriver of uh, Quebec City. And it's kind of a sad place in Canadian history. It's a national historic site. And, and we don't know how many thousands, maybe tens of thousands of migrants died regarding, died on uh, Gros Isle. Now, one of the things that uh, Bayfield, he didn't have any problem or so much problem with his Royal Navy uh, uh, seamen, but he sure did with crew discipline. Uh, harsh working conditions because the climate on the Northeast coast of Canada, Labrador and St. Lawrence is pretty unmerciful, it's pretty unforgiving, and it's harsh. And he had to compete with wages that the uh, merchant seamen were paying. So he usually got people that were disciplined problems to begin with that probably couldn't be hired by merchant in the merchant services. Um, Bayfield never resorted to the lash. He took pride in that. He never resorted to the lash, but he did. He was a big, uh, he, he did do the rum stop. At that time, every seaman in the Royal Navy or in the Royal Navy service was given a rum ration at noon every day. And that's a tradition that carried on until about 1971. And he was never hesitated to stop the grog ration, which he thought was, and he's probably right, cause of most of his indiscipline and problems. But we'll look at that in a sec. Okay, now, in June, July, 1833, while he's mapping the coast of Labrador, he serendipitously encountered um, John James Audubon, the great naturalist, the uh, artist naturalist who painted the Birds of America series. He was, uh, Audubon was on his last uh, leg of his expedition doing the Labrador, the, the, the birds of the Labrador coast. And they met each other. And as I said, the two ships, as I said, just uh, surprisingly encountered each other accidentally. And uh, one would think that the two men were total opposites. Uh, John James Audubon was the American, uh, the, 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 the stereotypical frontiersman, the long hair, um, long hair, 
front, you know, guy on the front, individualist on the frontier. He uh, he was born in Santa Domingo. Uh, his father, now his mother's parentage is kind of questionable. It's not 100% sure, but his father sent him, uh, they went back to France. The father sent him to America to avoid service in the Napoleonic War and Napoleonic's army. Napoleon was had invoked conscription and Audubon's dad sent him to the wilderness. So he's a guy that was trying to evade the discipline of military service. And he found freedom in the American wilderness where he thrived under the harshest conditions in the wilderness, as opposed to Bayfield, who at the age of not quite 11, uh, entered into the Royal Navy. He lived in a society where rank and obedience to authority were paramount hallmarks of service and you would think they wouldn't get get along or they would be hold each other in contempt but actually they got along famously in many ways bayfield and audubon were uh, kindred spirits they both had a reverence for nature they were both artists in their own way audubon through his bird paintings avia uh, ornithology paintings and bayfield through his charts and they got along in that summer famously in fact one of the more famous paint at least in canada is the common loon. Uh, the brace of loons was presented this uh, to uh, Audubon by one of Bayfield's officers on their expedition. Uh, they messed on each other's ship, meaning they ate together, discussed all and sundry poli politics, the church, everything. And they, as I said, they got on really, really well in Bayfield, called Audubon a superior person in every way. And when they split up in the, after the summer of 1833, it's not known if they ever corresponded again. But for that brief summer, or the, the, that brief time, that exchange of ideas was kind of important in both men's lives. Okay, so Bayfield, on a personal note, he's in Quebec City from 1827 to 41. He was active in the garrisons, uh, in the small English garrison social life. He was a founding member, and it still is around today, the Quebec Literary and Historical Society, other known as the Lit and Hiss. And he presented papers before the uh, society at their annual dinners. Now in Quebec, there was a rebellion in, Can in, in uh, Lower Canada, or Quebec, in 1837-38. And of course, as a British officer, he offered the services of he and his crew to the Governor General to suppress the rebellion. Uh, they weren't called on because the rebellion pretty much petered out. And in 1838, he was promoted captain, and he met and married Fanny Amelia Wright. She was a daughter of a colonel in the Royal Engineers who would later rise to become a major general in the Royal Engineers. And he would have been, he would have been quite a catch uh, at the time, single, uh, had a uh, promising career in the Royal Navy. He was a captain, which is a fairly high rank in the peacetime Navy. And the picture that adorns the cover of the, the book, the Bayfield Historical Society book, it doesn't have uh, the painter's name on it, but since uh, Fanny was an accomplished artist, musician, and teacher, I suspect that the painting was uh, painted by her. It's a very flattering portrait of Bayfield in midlife. Uh, he's wearing his captain's uniform, the double epaulets. And it's about the same time that they met and married, and I suspect she I, although I can't prove it, but I suspect that she's the one that painted Bayfield's picture, and it kind of fits in with some of the other work that she's done. In the lower left, there's you could tell her, her she was the daughter of a royal engineer because a lot of her sketches of Quebec and the landscape look like military engineering sketches. But uh, they had a very happy relationship. They had a very happy marriage, and they think and they had uh, how many several sons and two daughters. But in 1841, he'd surveyed the St. Lawrence River and plotted navigational channels, and uh, his charts were extremely welcome and successful with pilots. And then he moved the survey to Charlottetown PEI, because at this point, he has to survey the Gulf of St. Lawrence and, the La and, and more of the Labrador coast, get up the Labrador coast. And he was able to do that more effectively from Charlottetown and Prince Edward Island. And... Despite the, besides the harsh conditions we talked about, crew and discipline was a constant problem. I mentioned before, he never resorted to the lash. Actually, resorting to the lash, usually only on larger ships, and it wasn't like the Hollywood image of everybody getting lashed for almost everything. 
that's a little rare. Most of the seamen saw themselves as professional sailors or professional seamen, and they knew their job. And a lot of people that got the lash, the crews kind of thought they really, really deserved it. But anyway, Bayfield led by example, and he preferred punishment uh, but the stoppage of rum. Bayfield endured the same conditions that his seamen. He was out in the open top boats with his seamen. Um, the harshest thing I think he did, and it was made it almost been a death sentence. He um, gave, ex this is where he has a reverence for nature. Uh, there is a practice in the Royal Navy that they called sprit sailing, uh, sea dog or dogfish, which is a shark. And of course, seamen hate sharks because they tend to, uh, if there's a, it, it, they tend to in warmer climes in the water. But on one of uh, sprit sailing was a sailor would take a bowsprit, like a stick or a piece of wood. And as the dogfish were sailing along the bow of the ship while they were flying in the air, you throw one of the sprits at it and hope it would skewer it through the gills so that outside either side of the fish or the animal, when it hit the water, it couldn't submerge and cause the animal a tremendous amount of suffering and agony, the, the, the shark. And uh, he gave explicit orders to his crew not to do that. While he wasn't on duty, one of his officers reprimanded a seaman for sprit sailing uh, a shark. And when the uh, seaman just kind of defied him, and brought the shark on board and kind of um, threw it on, on the deck. Bayfield came on board and said, clap that man in irons. And he ordered him ashore. Ordering him ashore on the Labrador coast, he might have been picked up by a whaler or some other vessel, but it wasn't uh, it, 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 it wasn't the fate that most people would desire, but the point had been made. Um, in 1856, Bayfield, uh, retired. He was no longer able, although he was still in charge of survey, he was no longer able to perform sea duties and he was retired with the rank, elevated the rank of Rear Admiral in 1856. Uh, that season he uh, completed his final survey in, of the Halifax Harbor and the Nova Scotian South Shore and they were his final accomplishments at sea. While he was in retirement, he was consulted by the French because the French had two uh, Anacosti, uh, or no, um, San Pierre and Miquelon off the coast of Labrador. The American government consulted him regularly. The British government, of course, the Canadian government by that point, consulted him regularly on navigational issues. Uh, while he retired in Charlottetown, his house still stands. There it is there. And he was um, in old age. He was baptized as a child, but he was never confirmed in the Anglican church. I suspect he became more religious, largely through his wife's influence, and he became, as a late in life portrait of him, uh, a biography of him said, became a man of high religious pr principles, kind of the poor, and disposed to aid every good work, whose noble Christians did much in the past years to exert a beneficial influence on Charlottetown. And uh, you could see the picture of him in old age on the left. He's... Uh, Still standing ramrod straight, true military man standing ramrod straight, and uh, there's no mistaking him as a distinguished individual. In fact, uh, Bayfield was called Charlottetown's most distinguished citizen. Now, sadly, as he got older, he, uh, he couldn't leave. Uh, he, he became more and more feeble and infirm, and he couldn't walk any longer, and he was confined to the... Uh, uh, his bedroom on one of the uh, on the second floor for the last two or three years of his life and uh as i said he was consulted by several governments uh he was because even though you're retired in the royal navy you still stayed on the navy list and he was elevated to full admiral which would have given him that alone would have given him a gentleman's pension but the greenwich hospital which is a naval found they granted him 150 pound a year uh pension on top of his naval pension and as I said he was promoted to full admiral in 1867 and uh in one in one of his last reports the admiralty he wrote of canada that i love the country and feel for its welfare he died now uh, several of his children predeceased him including henry jr his oldest son died on station in the royal navy in belize or british honduras at the time and um his daughter helen died before him and the, the, he's buried in the old Protestant burying ground in downtown Charlottetown. He died at the age of 90 
in February 1885. And his legacy in 1867 of the 250 charts, the Admiralty issued for Canadian waters, 114 were drafted by Bayfield. And there are over 30 villages, geographic features, and provincial parks named after him. And, and, and on top of that, Bayfield, Wisconsin. Actually, he wrote Bayfield, Wisconsin. I think it was something like their 50th anniversary or their founding. They had some celebration. And he actually wrote them a letter. They asked him if he could come. He was too old to come by that point. But he did write them a letter saying he was a very, very gracious letter saying he was flattered that they named uh, a, a, a town or village after him. Funny enough, we have no correspondence to Bayfield, Ontario, which was 18, it was established in 1832. We have no idea that he corresponded with anybody here about Bayfield being his name, uh, a bill named after him. And actually, there is a USS naval destroyer in World War II named the Bayfield, which um, uh, saw service off the coast of Normandy in 1944. And until 1993, uh, four of Canada's hydrogra hydrographic vessels. Uh, were named Bayfield. And although his achievements were never acknowledged and is beyond the Admiralty, uh, he would deserve a place, I would say, in explorers of North America or British North America on a par with Thompson, Franklin, and others. And one of the things, this is a little self portrait of Bayfield, about 1820, that came from one of his survey notes. So I kind of thought he had a little bit of a, he did have a dry sense of humor, but Excuse me, a little humorous there. Now, as said, uh, as as Carrie said at the very beginning, if you're in our, we uh, the Bayfield uh, Historical Society wrote a 48 page, or I wrote a 48 page for the Bayfield Historical Society biography of Bayfield, which is illustrated. <coughs> Pardon me. Soft cover is twenty dollars. Limited edition is forty dollars, and you can get it from the Bayfield <coughs> Historical Society or from Facebook. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to field them right now. All right, David, thank you so much. Um, oh, you're very welcome. I, I have to admit, I learned so, I actually sat here and took notes, which is not something I normally do. So um, I thought that was fascinating. Um, I, uh, and I had my own notes and I've now, and now that I've taken all these, I just have to go back and, um, there were so many different things. I just, I like that his boats were named after instrument makers. Like it's, it's kind of an unusual, you know, you think about boats being named after or women you know, or yeah, like, yeah. 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 Or things like that. But no, they, he, he named them after instrument makers. Nothing more sexy than, <laughs> than a, London than a instrument good, makers. Yeah, yeah. A good Polaris producer. Um, uh, here's a question from Kenneth. How long were his charts used? Like for how many years were those, the charts being used? Well, some of them are used in the 20th century. In fact, I heard from an old Canadian Coast Guardsman that some of them on the inlets in Labrador, they were used well in the 1950s because they hadn't, the Canadian Hydrographic Service hadn't, until the 1950s, or maybe even later than that, hadn't charted all the waters in along the Labrador, Labrador and Newfoundland came to Canada in 1949. Okay. So they're in late. And so he was the, uh, and the Royal Navy hadn't done anything to chart the water. So that became an issue during the second world war, which is why after world war two, but his charts, they, they, I understand right up until the fifties until they were recharted, that they were still the go-to charts. If you wanted to go into a certain inlet. Um. So uh, I have another question um, from Mark Dursky, Dusky, sorry. Um, and I do know, you know, on the U.S. side of things, a lot of uh, the U.S.-based charts you can find in digital format online. Is there anywhere you can buy reproductions of Bayfield's early charts? Uh, yes, there is. And I would direct you to the Bayfield Historical Society because we, uh, there's a, yes, there is. You can get them from, I think, the Library and Archives Canada have copies, digital copies. Uh, some of his charts came up, I saw like originals. There are a lot of like, some of them came up about a year ago on eBay, if you can imagine. I didn't get them on time. Uh, but somebody else did that we sort of, the Bayfield Historical Society would love to get a hold of those original charts. And as I said, somebody in Sault Ste. Marie who collected charts, they died and his wife was 
divesting herself of his map collection. And she, he had quite a few Bayfield charts. Well, and they were cool. good ones of the Great Lakes too. Like, yeah, that would be, that would be really excellent. I like the fact that he also, he corresponded with Bayfield, Wisconsin, but not with Bayfield, Bayfield Ontario. Ontario. That's right. He, he, <laughs> he wrote them a very nice letter. He was flattered, couldn't make it, but thank you for naming, but nothing for to Bayfield, Ontario. Yeah. Um, he was actually and Bill in wants, Bayfield, Ontario. You know? Okay, yeah. Uh, Bill wants to know um, if there's any specifics. I think you said this, when and how his name was chosen for Bayfield, Ontario. Well, he was asked, in eight, when, when he went back to England in 1825, this company was forming to, but so one of the people that was part was Baron Van Tool. And Baron Van Tool was a Dutch baron who had assisted the British during the Napoleonic Wars. And well, there's, he sort of danced with Queen Adelaide at the time and as a way of paying him off, they thought let's get him out to the colonies. Good service, but there was a rumor about him dancing, whatever that meant, with Queen Adelaide who, and, and uh, so uh, Bayfield said, the, Baron Van Tile. These are good spots. He picked that part of Bayfield and the North Shore of Godridge here. In fact, his hunting lodge is forms the core of one of the oldest homes in the area, still there. And Baron Van Tile, he set up a mill on the south bank of the what's now the Bayfield River, and he named the river Bayfield, and he named the village Bayfield as a tribute to um, at that time Commander Bayfield, and that's how it got it named directly from somebody who knew him named the town after him. Now Baron Van Tile had kind of, they ended up, he didn't do well in Canada, but the family, the Van Toil family, Tool family, however that's pronounced, they went to the Dutch East Indies, and that family now is one of the wealthiest families in Holland. Uh, they, for a while, the Van Toul family actually lived in Washington, D.C., and were, knew Stephen Decatur very, very well, and he named one of his kids Niagara, because it was born near the Niagara River. And he went back and forth between the US and his hunting lodge here, but he didn't do very well financially here. In fact, he kind of got, you could read the Dunning letters that he got uh, from, from people chasing him down. But he was kind of an interesting, that, that's the guy that named Bayfield, is Baron Van Tool. And okay. as it'd be interesting to find out what sort of dancing they were doing, but with Queen Adelaide. <laughs> That's always what everyone wants to know, but anyway. What does dancing mean? Uh, so yeah. Gets, yeah, and then, oh, we got to get him out of here. Uh, okay, I have a question from the watch party. Uh, was the Royal Navy sharing his his charts, Bayfield's charts, with other nations, and I would assume presumably at least on the Great Lakes side with the United States, um, and if they were, how were they doing that? Well, actually, you know, surprisingly, considering they've been had two wars within half a century, the Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy, uh, they're a mutual admiration society in the 19th century. Like the U.S. Navy picked up a lot of Royal Navy traditions. And it was just kind of like the, I mean, anything that keeps people safer on the waters it helps everybody. A lot of like American commercial ships drift across the Canadian waters in storms. And so they kind of shared, like it was kind of an official agree, arrangement that they'd share each other's maps, especially on joint waterways. Like his say, like, like I said, that one map of lower, the, the first time we saw one was in an American archive. And it had obviously been part of a US Navy ship because it had US Navy stamped on it, but it was clearly Bayfield's map because it had his, like his signature on it and, and Royal Navy on the bottom. They shared maps just because it was in their mutual best interest. And, you know, like I said, they both did. Both navies did get along in the early 19th century. Uh, the U.S. Navy, right. I know they don't like to say it, but they copied a lot of British traditions, you know, Royal Navy traditions. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, now our questions are poured in fast and furious. Hold on. Um, this, I, and only because you brought it up, I found this interesting. Um, Patty wants to know, his early naval career seems very similar to the career of Captain Aubrey, one of Patrick O'Brien's characters. Do you know if O'Brien researched Bayfield at all before writing the Aubrey Maturin books? I'm sorry, I've not read those. I should. Uh, well, I don't know if he... Bayfield's career in the Royal Navy seems to be 
kind of typical, like Patrick O'Brien could have picked half a dozen or more young officers that went from kids, literally kids, like 10, 11 years old, all the way up through um, the Napoleonic era. I don't know if Patrick was aware of Bayfield's uh, service record, but uh, the amazing thing is that Bayfield belonged to a generation like of uh, romantic era heroes because at that time war was still considered a glamorous glory. I mean, what did Nelson run up at the Battle of Trafalgar? England expects every man to do his duty and you get that rousing cheer and and basically everybody did that could. But I'd be interested to know if he, if Patrick O'Brien was aware of Bayfield. Yeah, That'd be a great, be. Like, like Captain Aubrey is a, a Bayfield, or Bayfield is a Captain Aubrey type character. Right. That's interesting. I have kind of two questions here that kind of go together. Um, one is uh, sort of asking, let me, let me get both of them out there. How, how, basically, how did they map so many islands in the Georgian Bay so quickly? And then the sort of second part of that is assuming, you know, Canadian winters that they're probably only working six, eight months a year. They certainly aren't surveying. And so how are, I mean, how are you doing that with handheld non-electronic survey equipment that, that quickly yeah. and that significantly? Yeah, isn't that amazing? Uh, the daylight hour, of course, it's longer in day, but they did. They worked sun up to sundown throughout the, <coughs> pardon me, the summer months. And in the winter, they went and plotted. So they only had six, eight months of survey weather. But uh, amazingly, they managed to do that. And they seem to have done it fairly accurately. Like we're talking thousands of islands that were, well, what did right. he say he mapped in about six weeks or something like that? But it was just basically through hard work, perseverance, and skill that's i mean that's just and it's amazing and, and, and you know i wonder that too how they could how they could have done that and it's not like they could fudge and say oh we did all that because they had to submit the the charts right and you can go and look at the islands that they charted it is it's, it's an amazing co accomplishment an amazing feat that philip uh, uh philip collins and uh bayfield the Georgian Bay, which they did say was the most difficult part of their survey. Okay. Now, a lot of those islands that they map are no more than rock outcroppings. And uh, I don't know if anyone's ever sailed up there, but a lot of those islands are more like rock outcroppings coming up out of the water next to Georgian Bay or a much larger island. Okay. Yeah. So I don't um, know how much time oh. they would have spent circumnavigating little rocks. Right, right. Uh, here, Bruce wants to know what happened to assistant, his assistant, Philip Collins. Well, sadly, he died on he died in Bayfield service. He was drowned hmm. on Bayfield service on the Labrador coast. And about 18, uh, about 18, I, I, I might have the date wrong, but about. I think he was I, I think he I, I think he died uh, just before the season before or after the Audubon meeting. OK. And he wasn't very, he was just a young, like he was 15. He was born in 1802 or 1803. And he was only in his thirties when he died, but he had like decades of sea experience, but he died on sir, in service. Okay. He was promoted to full lieutenant, but he died in service. Um, he never found, uh, he, uh, sorry, so he, he, Bayfield kind of in his private correspondence said he never found another officer like Collins. Well, I think that, yeah, that comes across in some of the stories that you're telling and, you know, they're offering him anybody he wants and he's like, I'll take this, I'll take my guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, here's a, uh, I know you talked a little bit about how you do depths. His, his charts show very detailed coastal features. Did he include depth soundings in his notes or charts? Yes, he did. He sounded out the river mouths. Uh, he, he was given instructions to go as far inland not very far inland, like say a mile inland up the rivers in the Canadian side anyway. And he did do, they had a, some sort of primitive sounding device in the boat, which seemed to work at shallow depths. Like now, like they, 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 they measured the depths just off the, not deep sounding depths. They could have done that because they had the depths, but they did do a lot of measurements, depth measurements in and around the coastline. And they had, okay. like I said, that primitive depth sounding device, but they more usually had the lead line and just basically measured right. the fathings. And they but came across like out in the middle of the lake doing soundings. Yeah, right? no, they didn't really do that. They wanted to mark shoals 
that might be a navigational hazard uh, near the coastline. But okay. they didn't, as far as I know, they didn't do, well, you can see on the maps that they didn't really mark the uh, places that they knew that they could sail through. Here's an interesting question. And again, I, I, you know, you're talking as a historian and this may be a little far out, but I, it's worth asking. Would these charts be valuable today as a comparison for lake levels and other data with global warming and man-made changes? Oh, that is an interesting question. I would, oh, I don't know, but I'm gonna see if I can find the answer to that because I, because one of the other, I, I'm, I'm kind of in a lake here in Coastal Conservation Authority and uh, that would be so interesting to know. I mean, thank you for that question. There you go. There's always one. Yeah, that's a good um, I've got a couple of people still really kind of interested in this, uh, in the work on Georgian Bay. Um, uh, one, and again, we can kind of put these together. Did Bayfield name many of the islands himself that he surveyed? And then secondly, are they really charting all those really small rock outcroppings? Yeah. Like you were talking about. Uh, the outcroppings were attached, I, they, they did, but you know, those little small rock outcroppings, like in the, they, they probably just said there's one here. Uh, as what was the first because I had that what was the first oh uh was Bayfield naming some of the oh, islands yeah yeah, the that, islands that he yeah he did he named quite a bit of the uh like Owen Sound is it's a city in on Georgia Bay in Canada was named after his uh benefactor his mentor Captain William Fitzwilliam Owen and uh he named some of the like some of the places in on Georgian Bay especially are named after family members Collingwood he named Collingwood after Sir Cuthbert Collingwood, the guy that took over from Nelson after he was another Admiralty figure. And Barry, Ontario, was named after one of the Lords of the Admiralty. And he named a lot of like little, one of the humorous ones, sort of humorous, it's named Starvation Bay up in Georgian Bay. Okay. And uh, apparently the HMSB couldn't find them, Bayfield's party. So when they, at, at, they were a couple days or two or three days late. So uh, when they finally, the, when the HMSB, which is a small little gunship, uh, finally found the party to bring the supplies, they decided to kind of name the bay where they found them Starvation Bay. And it was more of a joke because they weren't starving, but they thought it was kind of humorous. So like, places like that, but he named it after people in his family, people in the Royal Navy, uh, there's a really good article on all the place names that he named in Georgian Bay and other places. Okay. Is that so he did, something publicly He didn't available? name all these places after himself. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He didn't name all these places after himself. Uh, I, I can even tell you the article um, in the bibliography. Well, I was just going to say, what we can, can do, I, David, is maybe you can email it to me. And then when I send out the okay. wrap-up email from this, I can include that with it because I think that sound. I mean, let's put it this way: I kind of want to read it. <laughs> so yeah, so he did um, name. A, yeah, he did. Short okay. answer is, he, and I'll send you the article, and it's online. The link is on. It's perfect. Online. That would be great, and then I can share it with easily with everybody uh, that's yeah. here with us tonight. Um, okay, I've got one final, and again, this is sort of a um, a follow up to you know this idea of of safety being a, a a na an international thing. Um, so did he make any charts of like say Southern shores of Lake Ontario or over on the other side of Lake Huron in Thunder Bay, Michigan? Was yes, he, he mapped both sides. He, he, he did and, and he was allowed to do that. He had authority, he had instructions that he could map both sides of lakes. Now the one lake he didn't go in was Lake Michigan. Cause that was right. like, I mean, that's solely American. It was there with that, he, he, but Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, he mapped both sides of, and I believe part of Lake Ontario, the, the American side of Lake Ontario, and he was allowed to be there. They knew he was there. In fact, he even picked up supplies from time to time in Detroit. Oh, okay. Victuals in Detroit, because it was right there in Detroit was uh, thriving at that time, uh, thriving right. settlement. I, I do always find it interesting that we've just come out of this, you know, big war in 1815, you know, at the end of 1815, and so quickly the two sides are working easily together. Yeah, and part of it is, remember who they are, they're officers. And even in, I, I'm always amazed that, like, for instance, this area was settled by officers. The Canada Company officers were Napoleonic era officers. 
And they always kind of thought that wars were affairs of gentlemen sort of thing. And so when a naval officer, a US, and it was, they, they, they treated each other like, I mean, they spoke the same language. I don't know if that helped or hindered relations sometimes, but I mean, they they seemed to get on whenever they encountered each other after the war when hostilities weren't on. They they didn't seem to hold a lot. Of, right. they, they didn't hold grudges or anything like that or this animosity that you would consider in modern war, but wars were so different then in the attitude right. towards it and who you were as an officer. Like it would be, like Bayfield would have been, I mean, if, if, if he'd encountered an American officer, it would have been rude to be anything other than polite and gentlemanly and all that other stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's a story in the Battle of Lake Huron, which the British wanted, the, the British recaptured two warships and they had the crews on board and the officers were, had the liberty of the deck, the American officers. They were allowed to keep their swords and had the liberty of the deck and the British dropped them off in Detroit and then sailed back home, sailed back well, up. I, I know. That's that's what Perry did with the officers from Battle of Lake Erie too. <laughs> yeah, and, and we would well. Tiger Dunlop was a doctor. He was one of our founders, and he tells a story in the War of eighteen twelve. He was out, he was a distinct. He was like over six feet. He was a Scots. He was a physician in the War of eighteen twelve, and he recalls being on the Niagara frontier going for a walk, and a figure in blue stepped out and said, "Doctor, your lines are over there." <laughs> You know, right um, on. Yeah, and and he got the hint, you know, and and I thought that was very polite and nice, and you know, that doesn't mean that wars are friendly kind of affairs when they, but once in a while they try to keep it civil. Right. Well, I think we are um, getting there. Sorry, I got one last question. I do have to. Watch, although I think you're going to say, I don't know. Why do you think he destroyed his journals? I have no idea. He and, and he he said he just it could be because it seems to be all the time that they moved from Quebec City to Charlottetown. It could be his wife said, "Get this stuff out of here." I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's as good. It's it, it, it's too bad because there's been no full length biography written of Admiral Bayfield, and part of it is he destroyed a lot of his journals. Almost everything I had to learn came from the Admiralty Papers. That it, like his correspondence, uh, his his journal or, or his journals for the Saint Lawrence. The first year and a half of them he threw out, but we have them from about 1829, but there's gaps. And I don't know, I can't explain why he would have done something as historically significant. He must have known what he was doing was important. Why would he toss those out? Because it would have been a, uh, it would have been a treasure trove of information on early Great Lakes history. No kidding. Yeah, I have no idea. Well, I will say, David, thank you so much. This has really been really enjoyable and again i'll be honest and say much more um fascinating than i expected it to be sorry oh thank you i, should, I shouldn't admit I that. but i really i was like I, I like i said i was enjoying it i was taking a bunch of notes um for those of you still left out there our next lecture in the spring series will be on march 29th at seven o'clock dan baker from the rutherford Mead hayes presidential libraries and museums will be with us in Toledo to discuss the President Hayes's relationship with Lake Erie, which includes his ownership of a small island called Mouse Island and how his descendants ended up bringing the dart boats to Toledo. As always, if you are not a member, now is a great time to join at nmgl.org backslash membership. And don't forget if you are interested in the uh, book that David wrote for Bayfield Historical Society, you can get that on, on Facebook or at bayfieldhistorical.ca, and I will include that in our follow-up emails, uh, whether it's Friday or Monday. So thank you everybody that has been with us tonight. Stay healthy and safe, and we hopefully will see you guys again in three weeks, and have a great night. Thank you again, David. This was fantastic. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.